in Sunday school. Let me pray for us. Let me explain something. So all you overachievers jumping on this test, okay? <laughs> and then you take the test. Okay, I'm playing. All right, let's pray together. Uh, our Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the, just the grace of the gospel and would help, would ask, help us to understand who we are in this world we live in as we talk now in Christ's name. Amen. So uh, this, is, uh, this is online. If you're watching online, it's going to be a big kind of a dead period because we have something we call the culture quiz. And this quiz has got some weird answers on it. It's got some answers that will make sense to you. And so what I would ask you to do, if you need a pencil, we've got plenty of pencils. If you don't have the test, let me know. You should have two pieces of paper. One is a test, and then one is it's got a triangle on it. And we're going to talk about that after we do the test. But I need to see where you're coming from on the test. And if we need more copies, let me know. Just answer the question that's most obvious to you from your cultural experience. That's all we're asking right? Don't overthink it, right? First answer, boom, write it down. First answer. Yeah, there's a bunch right there. Thanks so much for getting those. I'll help get some too. All right, so you're on. Thank you. Okay, I got it. I got it. Thank you. You can, you can only circle an A, a B, or a C. It won't, it won't, okay? So what you're doing, here's what this test is trying to do. It's trying to, sh to give you a sense when you read it and you're like, to get directions, people, okay, in your culture, what's the most likely thing someone's going to do? Are they gonna use a map or a GPS? Are they gonna ask other people? Or are they gonna pray for guidance? Map or GPS. Right, is what Diane, so that's what we're doing. What's the one response that's most likely the response that you think happens where you live in your culture? Yeah, so that was an important qualifier for you. Uh, if you could, uh, so and answers A, B, or C, there's no right or wrong answer. You want one? Just for fun, man. Okay. I need another one. Or do we need any more? Got one right here. All right, I'll be right back.
you'll have to kind of play it by ear a little bit because I think I need to move on. <laughs> so you can kind of fill it out as we go. Um, everybody done? Nope. All right. Like I say, don't overthink it. You read it, first thing that comes to mind, this is the, this is the one response that's most common in my culture. That's all you're doing. What's that? I said try to think Okay, about, about, we'll do about two more minutes, okay? And then we'll start doing some answers. Uh, ah. Okay, um, sorry, but I think we need to, for time's sake, kind of move on. So here's the way we're going to do this. Um, Lyndon, will you go to the next slide, please? So the answer key is color-coded. And here's, here's the way the game works. You look at number one, that should, this should match your handout, okay? You look at number one and your answer, and you either did A, B, or C, so you're either purple, green, or orange, right? So you just write down, if you did A, write down a P for purple. If you did B, write down a G for green. If you did C, write down O for orange. And do that, we're going to do that on each one, okay? Because what we're trying to figure out is not whether you answered A, B, or C. What we want to know, did you answer purple, green, or orange? Does that make sense? Can y'all y'all may not can y'all see that looking that way? Is that this blocking too much? Y'all okay? So so number one, two, eight, and nine. As you look at your piece of paper, right? Those four are there. So write down. Did you answer purple, green, or orange? That makes sense. What's that? Right, right. So to, to do this. This is what ha was, in order to put this up, I had to do it. I just took a snapshot of this, and there's one, eight, two, nine. Or the next slide is going to be three, ten, four, eleven. The next slide is going to be five, twelve, six, thirteen. So you can look at this sheet of paper and just write down the. That makes sense. So it's going to look like this, and write on your piece of paper. Like so, for an example, when I did it. I wrote a P by one because I answered purple. I wrote a, a P by two because I answered formal education. Right? That makes sense? I put a, an A by eight. I mean, a P by eight. See, that's confusing. Right? Because I answered purple. See the pattern? Well, we, I have to wait till everybody's done. Right? So has everybody graded those first four? All right, go to the next slide, please.
All right, everybody got those? Nope, okay. All right, next slide, please. Next slide. Almost done. When I should have said no cheating off others. <laughs> I took that for granted. Aren't we good? Next slide. Good. All right. Next slide. Oh, wait, go back. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, we good? Next slide.
There's just one more question. That's the next slide, number 20, I think. It's the only one you haven't done yet. So, Linda, if you'll, yeah. And by local market, they mean like, you know, think about in these other countries, you go and have all the marketplace with all the food. Not like, Walmart. yeah, not like Walmart. <laughs> And I guess that's wild nature. And, uh, all right. Now, now what you do, what, uh, if you would please go back over, count up how many P's, how many O's, and how many G's you got. Okay. Oh, oh okay. How's that? Oh. All right. How many P's? How many O's? How many G's? Okay. Did anyone have, does anyone have the majority of your answers the color orange? All right, one, all right. Anyone have the majority of your answers green? Anyone, uh, what, a couple of green, okay. Um, I'm not surprised, yours weren't green. Okay, I'm a little surprised. All right, how about purple? Okay, did anyone have all of your answers purple? Like you didn't have anything in another color? Okay. Oh, you're purple, okay. We'll let you be purple with us. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's the, so here's what this is. When we're thinking about the mission and we're realizing something that we live in a particular culture and it becomes very clear to you that you live in a particular culture when you take a quiz like this because you're saying, well, look, in my culture, here's the way things work. This is the way we do things, all right? And you live in a innocence guilt culture. This is the culture of the West, if you will. This is Western Europe, maybe it's changing, um, the U.S., Australia, okay? When you go to those places, they are going to see the world generally the way you see it from the pers on the, when it comes to the big issues of life and the sense of innocence versus guilt, okay? And think about the way we share the gospel, right? We're going we're gonna to lay out the gospel in such a way where somebody understands they're a sinner in the sight of God, justly deserving His displeasure, without hope, save in His sovereign mercy, right? That's what we lead with in this particular culture. <clears throat> what if you go to a different culture, but, or maybe more importantly, what if that culture comes to you? There are 330 million people in the United States. The estimate is 50 million were born outside the United States. Let that sink in. More than one in seven were born, born outside the United States, and they live in the United States. We have, I'm told, I haven't studied this, but from a pretty reliable source, like 282 unreached people groups in the United States. An unreached people group is a group of people where less than 2% are evangelical Christian because once you go past 2%, then they, they think you can multiply. So we've got all these pockets all over the United States where people have come from other nations, but they were not Christian where they came from, so there's no evangelical witness in those little subgroups. So they're here, right? And you need to be aware right? Honor, shame. That's a completely different way that people, as it were, filter things. Uh, what does that, let me just give you some thoughts about these three different, three different cultures and where you find them in the world with the reality that they're coming here. And so we want to have an awareness of that as we think about responding uh, to the mission, right? So let's start innocent guilt. 
Okay, that's us. Our fo- our, the question we ask is, what is right and wrong? That's our big question. We're fact-driven. Things are kind of black and white, right? Our language is the language of the law court, right? And that goes into, right, that's Romans, isn't it? We it really emphasize in the book of Romans, right, the, the, the legal, you know, rights we have because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Um, you know, we respond to, um, well, I'll skip that. Our social structure is individualistic. We're, you know, North America, Europe, Australia, about a billion people fall into this culture. A billion people in the world. Um, our Christian heritage is what we call Augustinian, right? Whether you're Roman Catholic or Protestant, in the, fif- in the 1500s, it was a big deal to be Augustinian. So everybody's been influenced by Augustine, whether you know it or not, <laughs> okay? Um, so that's our, that's our heritage, Okay in that sense. And so when we think about God, we often think about God, first of all, at least some of us, most of us would be holy and just. That's our concept, okay? That's what we call an innocent guilt culture, the purple people, okay? The green people come from what we call honor-shame cultures, right? The question they ask in those cultures are, they're not asking so much what is right and wrong, they're asking, where do I fit in? Where do I belong in this community? And so it's very important how you're perceived, right? Is that, is that very important how you're perceived? Um, their security and significance comes from the community. Our significance and security is typically found in wealth or knowledge. Wealth or knowledge, community. They're more collectivistic, right? Right? Because we're talking about, um, really we're talking about the Middle East, Southeast Asia, really more than Southeast Asia, uh, Asia. But we're also talking about 4.3 billion people. Completely, they see the world, they process things differently than you do. From a Christian standpoint, their theology is very undeveloped. They do see God as loving Father. Because they're, remember, they're community, family-oriented. I remember I picked up Jiraj from India several years ago and was driving him here. One of the folks we worked with over there, we're driving from Montgomery down here. And along the way, he asked, he says, David, let me ask you a question if it's okay. He said, is it true that in your culture, when a child turns 18, the family expects them to leave the home? I said, that's pretty common. He said, wow. Never heard of such a thing. He said, why do you do that? That was his question. Why do you do that? He said, in my culture, we love our family, we want to be together, and we just, we don't have that expectation. It was very different. I'm like, really? Hey, when I was 18, man, I just got the boot. <laughs> not really. I know. My mom's like, that's not true. And, uh, uh, but, th- but I had friends who did. Graduated high school. Two weeks later, they were out of the house. Because that's what was expected. You're a man. Get out there and figure it out. So, um, very different way they see the world. And so, think about the impact. Shame. Shame in say Asia, is felt inward, which is why they lead the world in the suicide rate. Shame in the Middle East is dealt with outward in honor killings. So that's, again, a little bit different way of viewing the world. Okay, what about power and fear cultures? Um, they're concerned, like, where am I in the order of things, right? Where am I on the pecking order? Do I have more power? Or do I have less power? They have a great awareness of spiritual beings. Their security and significance will come from climbing the ladder, right? So they have more power. So they can exercise more control over the world around them. They respond really well to miracle stories because that's about power. Their social structure's more animistic. We're talking... You know, Southeast Asia, Africa, Caribbean, those types of 
those types of cultures, and you're about 1.4 billion people. So think about that. 4.3, 1.4, about 1 billion. The way you view the world is a significant minority if you were to travel around the world. And again, by God's grace, they're coming here, and we can share the gospel with them here. But we have to have an awareness that they actually think differently. I was in, where was I? I was in Iraq. <clears throat> Drove me nuts. Now, it was a short drive, but it was scenic, okay? So I'm in Iraq, and I'm trying to interact with these. I had the same thing happen when I was in Venezuela. I mean, I've just about gotten a fight with a guy in Venezuela. You've got to remember something, but this was my other life, because um, I was all about the truth, <laughs> and this guy was not. So we were, we were about to throw down, and... Um, uh, because he was accusing me of something that wasn't true and again uh, to a superior and this guy was from a different culture right he was from this culture and I was from this culture I didn't understand the dialogue I only knew one thing to do at that point in my life and that's throw down with the guy so okay I've come a long way all right <clears throat> so but same thing in, in, in Iraq I'm having these conversations with these people and they're this bald-faced lie I'm like I know that's a, I know it's not true you know that's not true, and you're standing up there blah, 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 about what I'm thinking. What are you doing? He was saving face. He was saving face because that was more important to them, maintaining their sense of honor. Do you ever wonder why before uh, we went into Iraq, Saddam Hussein would go on his, his radio or TV and talk about how all these wonderful things about them and they didn't do whatever? What was he doing? He, was, he knew it was not true. In fact, when, they inter- when the FBI interrogated him after they captured him, he, he, you know, he's like, of course I knew it wasn't true. What was he doing? His honor was on the line. The honor of his people was on the line. That was the most important value in that culture. And so he got on and said things. Everybody's like, that's not true. <laughs> but you've got to save face. And that's more important. It's been driven into them since birth that that's more important than this. What's been driven into you since birth is that that's more important than this. Okay? Now, the sinful aspect of this and the sinful aspect of that and the sinful aspect of that is sinful no matter where you go. But sometimes the way it just helps you understand, why why are people doing this? It helps you understand where they're coming from a little bit when you think about that. And here's the beautiful thing. The gospel speaks to every culture. 2 Timothy. Listen to the, listen to the wording. We'll just, go through just three, we'll just go through three passages here and show you how the gospel speaks to, to different cultures, to all cultures with the same truth. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not give a spirit of timidity, right? But a spirit of power, of love, of self-discipline. Those are the values in those cultures. Isn't that interesting? Acts 26, 18. I'm sending you to them. This is Jesus telling Paul to open their eyes and turn from their darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified. He's speaking to every every person in the world according to their culture. Isn't that wild? You give this test to people in Asia, right, they're all going to be green. You're all purple. You give it uh, to people in Africa, they're going to be orange. Because that's the way they were enculturated in life. They all need the same gospel. And the gospel you have is the wisdom of God for all the nations. All right? uh, Ephesians, my favorite, one of my favorite passages, favorite prayers, okay? What is he going to pray for them in Ephesians? This is the Apostle Paul praying. I also pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope, right? That's we emphasize hope a lot, the hope to which he's called you. I think I need a longer arm or stronger glasses, all right? The hope to which he's called you, the riches of his, of his glorious inheritance in the saints, right? 
I have a home, I have a name that's meaningful to me, okay? And what? The incomparably great power for those who believe. That's what I want you to be able to see. See what, what God's doing for us? He's given us this message, and this message is able to speak to different cultures, and they will drive you nutty if you don't, like they did me, right? As you try to interact with them, okay? And if you want to speak to someone locally, I'm going to put you on the spot, Lori. If you're someone locally who's been trying to do that with this kind of a culture, right? Y'all been inviting folks over, having conversations, that type of thing, and they think a little differently than you do, right? And so, what are the stories you want to tell them? You want to tell them the stories of God's love. Tell them the stories of, of God taking away their shame. Tell them the stories of, tell them the prodigal son story, right? Think about the prodigal son. I think you know it well enough. Why, the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, remember, right? He takes the inheritance and he goes to the far country, squanders it, ends up, eating with the pigs, which was, you know, and he's Jewish, and that was bad, right? About as bad as it gets. Why was he, why was he in such a pickle? What, what did he, what had he done wrong? Well, that, okay, so he wishes father dead, all right? Keep thinking, keep thinking about if you have to to summarize it from the way you view the world, what did he do wrong? He, all right, you're, you're, you're thinking according to this, <laughs> and you're right. But I was kind of expecting somebody, well, he sinned. He sinned against, doesn't he say that when he comes? I sinned against heaven and against you, right? I sinned against heaven and against you. And so we're like, okay, children, don't sin against your parents. You won't end up eating with the pigs. Moral of the story, right? But listen to, just listen to the things that happen when the prodigal son is coming home. He came to his senses. He said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. So what then becomes the result of your sin? In our culture, we say it's you're guilty. In an honor-shame culture, the result of your sin is that you don't belong. So that's what he says. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went home. See, this was written in this culture. And there's a lot more of this in here than I bring out because I've been so enculturated into this, in this particular culture. But it's going to help you understand, listen, the next generation. If you are, uh, you know, if we had time, we'd collect everybody's totals. And, and I'd almost bet the older you are, the more purple you were. And perhaps some of the younger ones were a little, yeah, they were still majority purple, but maybe a little bit less than some. I think I had four that were not purple. Anybody have, anybody else have four or less that were, or I should say, anybody have 20 or more purple answers? Anybody besides me? Yeah, yeah. We, we're pretty, we're pretty, we're pretty strong over here in this one, okay? Um, so here, but here's what's happening. If you're, if you're, oh, I don't know, I don't know how old is, not anymore. <laughs> but if you're old, right, and you look at a younger generation, what's happening? The younger generation in the United States is shifting toward an honor-shame culture. That's where they're shifting toward. And you look at it from this and you say, Oh my goodness, because what? They are more, typically in honor, shame cultures, more collectivist. It's more about the unit. It's more about the community. It's more about that type of thing. Typically, that's where we're drifting toward as you think about interacting with people who are younger and sharing the gospel with them, okay? 
Why is this happening? It's not their fault. They are connected to the world. And if your brain developed before you had one of these, your brain developed before you were connected to the whole world. Amen and hallelujah. <laughs> but the connectedness weighs and the values of the community become so important for that younger generation. And you're going, why can't you just stand on your own two legs? And you're like, you don't understand. I feel the weight of my world. And they think differently than you think. They don't think wrong. Well, if they sin, think sinfully, that's wrong. But just being from a different culture is not sinful. Thinking different than you is not sinful. It's just the way people have been, they, they perceive their world. And so our challenge in responding to the mission conference is having an awareness of who am I, what do I respond to, and who's the person I'm speaking to? And here's the beautiful thing I think about this gathering right here. Uh, and this is something we're going to, I hope, accent more. But see, we've got a lot of this here, right? Like I say, I think I was a 21 or something on it. I'm a, I'm a pretty purple guy, okay? So we got a lot of this. You know, do you know what else we have? We got a lot of this. We got a lot of people who, who will open their home. We've got a lot of people who, who love uh, community. We've got a lot of people who love fellowship. And see, those are gateways for honor, shame communities. So we, we're, 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 God has positioned us by gathering who we are to be able to minister to lots of different kinds of folks. We just have to be aware that we need to be intentional as we do it. Does that make sense? So I'm excited about where God's positioned us. He has put you here and gathered this community for a time such as this. And that's exciting. So I want you just to be aware of that. Here's what I would like to do next week is kind of part two to this is going to be something that you, you kind of scratch your head over. So I don't want to give it away because you're going to get like, Really? It's, it's going to almost be anticlimactic, like the next step. How do we do this, right? We, I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, the hint is we do it together, right? We do it together. We, we do these, right, in light of the fact that we've got this too, right? But talk to, talk to Pastor Lynn and Miss Ramona sometime about the years they spent in, in this culture, some of our children got to hear about it during the missions conference because for the first time we asked Pastor Lynn, and, and I don't know if you were both there because I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off, but they shared about their experience, right, as missionaries in Africa. What a different world and the way people thought. And wow. So sometimes ask him about that. Ask Lori about her interactions. Ask people who've had a chance to be around or in different cultures. What was it like? How were they different? Because they're becoming your neighbors. And together, together, we can reach them with the gospel. And that's what we want to do. Okay? So that's how we respond. Right? And we'll focus on that a little bit next week in some very practical ways. So next week you get a survey. The survey is going to be different ways that you can serve, different ways you can connect, different ways you can do things as God Right? As you bring your little bread and fish to Jesus, and he gives it back, right? you got to give it to him first. You're not here to save the world. You're here to give it to Jesus. And when he gives it back, you go and take it to your neighbor. Okay? And we want to figure out some ways we can do that together next Sunday. All right? So, Patrick? Stop it all. And the Afghans were, it was normal. It's what we always do. 
Right, so you got this unit going to New Mexico from the U.S. to help Afghan refugees kind of be incorporated in our culture, and they discovered that the men had no problem just beating their wives because that's what they did in their culture. And the women had never seen anything any different. It's like this one story I'd heard recently about a, a, a young girl, and I can't remember which culture it was in. It might, I think it was in this one. Yeah, it was in this one, and she had like a couple of days off from work, and, a, and someone from the U.S. was talking to her, and they said, so what do you do with your time off? She said, what do you mean? Well, what are you going to do Saturday and Sunday? She said, whatever my dad tells me. She had no concept of her life being hers to live. It was lived under the authority of her dad that she might not, might not bring shame in the family. She didn't have a concept of free time for herself. Isn't that interesting? And we're like, are you nuts? <laughs> yeah, they are, in a way, right? From our perspective. But from theirs, what do they say about you? You're nuts, right? You know the church, and I've heard recently from some people who interacted with the church in China that, there are, that the Chinese church prays for you. I, hope you. I want you to know that. Because they feel sorry for you. Because you have so much freedom, you've squandered the gospel. That's their viewpoint of America. Yeah. And they're like, they just need us. They're like, oh, Lord, just give them a little bit of pressure so they will humble themselves and take up their cross and follow. That's the way the world sees us. Okay? I want the world in Dothan to see you like you are, which is beautiful to me. I love, I love you all. I think God's put us here, and he's given us this, this unique opportunity uh, to be able to grow together in some ways to reach some of these other cultures because of the way he's made you. So uh, I'll tell you what, we'll pick this conversation up next week. Uh, I hope this was helpful for you, and I think next week will be uh, equally so. Let's pray together. Uh, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the amazing grace that you've given us. Thank you that you have um, brought us to yourself, and you've shown us our guilt and Father, we acknowledge that. But you've also removed our shame and brought us great honor by giving us a new name and a new family. And you've given us resurrection power. That power that was at work in Christ when you raised him from the dead, you've given it to us that we might not live in fear. So Father, help us to, to grasp the full gospel that it changes our entire life for the joy of all the nations, and for the praise of Jesus. We ask in his name. Amen. All right. Thank, thanks for staying.